All right, so this, this is uh, the lecture on chapter nine on assembly drawings. So you guys learned how to do individual drawings for specific parts and follow certain specifications and protocols. You learned about cross-sectioning, you've learned about tolerancing and dimensioning. So now we're gonna do the final part of what you need to know to do basic engineering drawings and that's assembly drawings. So as an assembly drawing is shown here, uh, it's a simple, it looks like a steel guitar of some sort, and it shows how the parts go together, okay? So notice that there's no dimensioning in this drawing, right? It's just a, basically how the parts come together. All right. So you're gonna learn how to create an assembly drawing and how to create a standard part sheet. And this is typically done with your teams um, and part of your team project, okay? But we'll have to skip that part this semester. So assembly drawings show how individual parts fit together um, to make a machine or a device or, you know, multi-faceted type of piece of equipment. And then the standard part sheet contains all the standard parts that you would get off the shelf, right? There's no need to do it. Um, detailed design drawings on screws and nuts and bolts. You just specify um, what screw, nut, and bolt you need. Um, and it's, a, it, it, it's all put into the standard parts sheet. And this will make more sense as we go through it. Okay. What is an assembly drawing and why do we need them? All right, it's a drawing of an entire machine with all of the components located and identified. So here's an example of a flange coupling. Okay, so you can see the assembly drawing. It shows, um, I think, six different parts. The isometric view of this um, completed system or assembly is in the upper right. That's to help people visualize what this thing really looks like. And then you see the item numbers up in the upper left. Okay, that's a list of all the individual parts that make up the assembly. And they're identified with find numbers within balloons. So those little round circles that you have there are called balloons. Okay. And um, they, they have what's called the find number inside the balloon. Right. And the balloons are always arranged very nicely and orderly. So um, you, can, you can find the, the parts well. Notice that the, um, that the arrows aren't crossing each other over, right? And it reduces the confusion factor um, if you keep everything nice orderly in a row or in a column, okay? And you can also see that the list of parts up in the upper left um, shows the quantity. You can have descriptions in there. You can even put in things like what type of material and, and that sort of thing. Okay. You can also have sub assemblies. So if something's really complex, say a jet, you'll have lots of sub assemblies. So your main assembly drawing may show engine, wing, you know, fuselage. And then you go to fuselage and then it'll show the individual components of the fuselage as sub assemblies. And you go into the sub assemblies. And the subassemblies will have subassemblies until finally you get down to the individual parts. Okay. Um, of course, we're not making a Boeing 747. Um, you know, you probably won't work on something that complex, but you might have something that is an air conditioning unit, and you may be working on, say, the compressor part of it, right? So the subassembly of the air conditioning unit would be the compressor. And another might be the fan system, and another might be the housing. Okay, so um, so think about that. You know how you, when you would want to have sub assemblies and when you wouldn't want them. Okay, and it's all about making making everything clear, so that the people who manufacture and assemble your designs um, do it right. Right, that's the ultimate goal: do it correct and efficient. Okay, so here's an example. Uh, Subassembly is two or more parts that form a portion of an assembly. 
Okay, so a car engine would be a subassembly to a car. A bike derailleur has multiple parts, and that would be drawn up as a subassembly to your bike. Okay, so you get the idea. Okay, so um, if you want to respond to this in the chat box, you can um, think about it. Does an assembly drawing normally show the size of parts? Remember back to the example I showed at the beginning? All right, a few people are answering. Um, no. That's correct. You don't want to clutter up an assembly drawing with a bunch of um, dimensions, okay? There might be some rare examples, like if a certain part only goes in exactly, you know, 2.7 inches, you might want to indicate that in your assembly drawing. Okay. Well, let me go back a slide. Okay, so the assembly drawing's job is to locate where the parts go. And we've all had experience with assembly drawings, putting together bikes and furniture and stuff like that. So you guys understand what that is. Okay, so how do you show the size of an individual part? You do that in a detail drawing. So the assembly drawing shows how all the parts go together, right? And then part of your engineering drawing package would be an assembly drawing, showing where all the parts come together. And then the next page, would be um, a detailed drawing of one of the parts. And then the next page is a detailed drawing of another part. And the next page is a detailed drawing of yet another part. Okay, so in each of the detailed drawings, that's where you do your dimensioning. And you might have to have multiple views for that part, right? And you follow all of the rules for making a, a detailed drawing that, that you've learned in the previous sections, okay? Oh, someone put, Ryan put in, uh, building Legos has prepared me for this. Yeah, absolutely, right? You, especially the new Lego Star Wars things where they have, you know, sub-assemblies that you have to put together and then you put together that in the main assembly and you may have a thousand parts, okay? So there, there you have an assembly drawing, a sub-assembly drawing, and then individual parts, okay? So a working drawing package includes the assembly drawing and it includes detailed drawings and it includes the standard um, part sheet. And there may be multiple standard part sheets if you have a lot of standard parts. And there's different ways you can identify those parts in the standard part sheet, okay? And we'll show a few different examples today. But that's called a working drawing package, okay? So what's the order that you put a working drawing package together in? Well, you start with the assembly drawing that shows how everything goes together and what it looks like overall. Okay, and then, then it's followed by the different parts. If you have sub-assemblies, you'd have an assembly drawing and then you'd have a set of sub-assemblies and then you'd have the parts, okay? And then the last sheet would be the standard part sheet. And this could be 10, 10 pages long, it could be 200 pages long, just depending on how many parts you have. So let's talk about the different components used to make an assembly drawing. So here's a pretty simple assembly drawing, okay, showing uh, um, how something is, is put together and, and the different parts. And in this case, there's only three parts shown Okay, and if you look at the bottom where the, the parts are listed, you know, and it's pointing to the individual parts listed, you see the find number that's in the first column. Okay, and then the quantity part or identification number. So if you're working in a factory or a facility where you're assembling different things, the part or identification number you would use to go pick the part off the shelf when you put this together, okay? And every company has a different way of labeling part numbers, okay? So that's gonna be unique to where you're working. You usually wanna put a description in. That way people can say, yeah, that does look like a top plate or the bottom plate or a pin, okay? 
And you can include materials. Sometimes, you know, you'll have a quarter inch pin, for example. You might have one made out of aluminum and one out of steel, depending on, on what the application is. So you might need to specify the material. Okay. So this is a, an example of an injection mold that you would make. Um, this is a, just a standard injection mold that you see here, okay? Um, and notice the parts list, in this case, is on the bottom. And when you put the parts list on the bottom, the fine numbers go in the opposite order. It goes from one, two, three, going up. If you take your parts list and put it on the top, if that fits better, then the order would go the other way, go from top down. Okay, it's very weird, but that's a that's a standard that they use. Okay, and um, you know when when teams put together their their final drawings, that's a requirement. So when you're in design two, you're going to make a, a design of a widget, right? And you're going to put together um, a set of drawings, and you have to follow these protocols. So just because you're not doing um, a project this semester right you still have to know this for next semester okay so you may want to copy some of these these things down into a flash drive or something so next semester when you take d2 you can refer back to it okay all right so let's take a look at what's circled here we've got part identification so that's just ballooning they call it ballooning um, and they kind of look like you know balloons on a string um, and you can see it's pointing to the individual parts and then within the balloon there's a find number and that find number indicates um, what part um, what part you've got um, that you're pointing to so the find number goes inside the balloon and then the leader line comes up leader lines don't cross okay and it's organized in a nice orderly manner it doesn't look cluttered, okay? So it's gotta look good. And then down here in the title block, there's a lot of information, and this is standardized at the, your place of work. So in this case, we've got the person who drew it. So the drafter may not be um, a professional engineer, okay? But maybe the person who checks the drawings and approves it would be a licensed professional engineer in, in some cases. Um, if you work for, you know, producing parts for the military or for the city or the state, there always needs to be a PE after your name if you're going to be the one signing off on, on the designs. Um, typically, there's one or two of those folks on staff in an engineering company, and the rest of them don't have a PE, but they, you know, they do most of the design work. Okay, so we've got a drafter, we got someone who checked it, we got another person who signed off on it, that's probably the PE. And then there's, you know, some other information that might be necessary for the people who actually um, put this thing together. And you have other information as well, like what kind of projections you're using and that sort of thing. All right. So ballooning is, is how you identify the different parts. Okay. Um, so it consists of a, of a circle or a balloon, um, a, um, a locator number, okay, or a find number, and a leader line. Pretty simple. So here's another example with a little bit more complexity. It's very nicely done. You have all of your um, balloons organized either vertically or horizontally, okay. They have that same font inside the um, balloons, easy to read, okay? And the leader lines point directly to the part. And you wanna, you wanna place the, the balloon and the leader line in such a way that um, they point to the part directly. Like I wouldn't put number two over here and then try to cross all this stuff and, and locate, locate the part that's on the opposite side, okay? And it, it makes sense, right? You can look at it and say it makes sense. All right, next slide. So se selecting views, okay? So does an assembly drawing 
Need a front top and right side view? So what do you think? All the time, yes, sometimes, or no? All right, we've got a few people saying it's um, sometimes, so that's, that's correct. So occasionally you will need to have all the views, but some of the times you may, or, or most of the time you may only need one or two views. Okay, so the answer is sometimes. So we need as many views as it takes to identify and locate each part. If a part's hiding behind something, right? Hiding behind it, then you'll need another view so you can identify it. So you'll identify some, some of the parts you know, on this view and then the view next to it, the side view, you'll identify the other parts, okay? So it could take one view, it could take two or three. So this one needed to have all three views. And you can see there's 10 or 11 parts on this one. Okay, and they actually show part 10 twice to give it a little bit more clarity. It's the same part, but you're seeing it through a cross-sectional view. So sometimes you have to section it to see the part inside of another part, okay? So you can use section views in assembly drawings. Here's a uh, prime example. This is a vise, and they've actually managed to locate all the parts in one view by taking advantage of, of sectional views. So you can see you kind of chewed out a bit here, and you can see inside, okay? So you can do that as well. And this only required one view. So a parts list could look as simple as this, right? Bill of materials. This will give the, the person an idea you know, how many parts are in there and they can cost it out. If one part goes up in price, you know, then the cost of the entire assembly will, will be adjusted accordingly. Okay, so they're, they're gonna contain fine numbers and part numbers. Okay, and they may contain other things such as the number of parts required and, and the materials that they're made out of. Okay, and then additional things, depending on where you work and what the needs are, you might include the stock size, the cage code, and the part weight. The part weight can be very, very important um, when you're pitching um, a design of a widget to a company um, that wants you to build something for them, design and, and, and you know, come up with a build for it. The reason the weight is important is they're gonna look at how much will it cost me to ship this thing. Okay, so if you're putting something together, um, you know, that's gonna be fabricated in China, right? You have a nice design for it. Your boss and the people who are gonna end up buying it from you are gonna wanna know what it weighs. And then they can decide, are we gonna fly these in or are we gonna put them on a boat? right because shipping is dependent on the weight and and the size so weight could be an important factor and you would include that in the in the parts list and then that way you can see oh well these parts we can fly over they're light the other parts will will inventory a higher number in our in our assembly site so we'll have ten thousand of those and then the others will just get in as needed Okay, so those are kind of the things you may want to think about as an engineer because um, having a lot of inventory is expensive too. But if there's a cost effectiveness for having an in a lot of inventory, you have to weigh that, no pun intended. Okay, so section views, right? Section views are used quite often when drawing assemblies. And, you know, why would you do that? Well, we already discussed it, but here it is. Assemblies often have parts fitting into or overlapping other parts, and we need to look inside the assembly to see it clearly. Okay, so here again is that one example. We can see inside, so we can see where the pin is located, because it's inside the two halves of the um, injection mold. Okay, what about section lines? Well, we did cross-sectioning, so this should be more or less a review. Um, these are a little higher level specifications from what you're used to. And we'll go into that with a couple of examples in the next few slides. So the biggest area on your sectional view are gonna have lines that are drawn at 45 degrees. 
The next largest will be at 135 degrees or 45 in the opposite direction. So you do 45 one way and then you do 45 the other way. That's what that means. And then you do the other areas with 30 and 60 degree lines respectively, and they get closer together um, for smaller areas. Okay, so let's look at an example. So let's say you had to section this. So you fill in the largest section first. Okay, so here's 45 degrees. Then you do the second largest. You do 45 degrees in the opposite direction. Then you do the next largest. Okay, now you're doing 30 degrees with a smaller spacing. And then you do um, 60 degrees or the opposite with the same kind of spacing, okay? So it makes sense. So let's just do that real quick again, right? Biggest one, biggest spacing, 45 degrees, next biggest, 45 degrees the other way. In this case, keeping the spacing the same works. Smaller area, tighter lines, different angle, different angle yet again. Okay, and that just makes it easier for you to see the differences between the different parts. Okay, so what, what about some things you may want to include and may not want to include? So you always have to go back to the original premise. The purpose of the assembly drawing is to show how the different parts go together. Okay, uh, it is not a manufacturing print. Those are the detailed drawings that follow the assembly drawings. Those are the, the manufacturing prints. Okay, so sometimes um, lines that are necessary in a detailed drawing are gonna be left out in your assembly drawing so that it's more clear. Right, the key is, is, does it show me how the parts go together and do I understand it? Okay, so do we include hidden lines? Yeah, because it enhances um, the clarity of the, the design. You only use them when it's necessary to, to be clear, to add clearness to your drawing. Um, it should be left off when they impair that. Uh, when a section view is used, hidden lines should not be used in that view. And we talked about that when we were talking about sectioning. Okay, do we include dimensions? Usually not, okay? As a rule, dimensions are not given on an assembly drawing. If dimensions are given, they're limited to some function of the object. So let's say you have a sliding part, right? And you only slide it in so far. Okay, they're included in the detailed parts drawings, okay? All right, so let's apply what we've learned. We're just flying through this stuff today. I hope I'm not going too fast. Um, I'm gonna post this on, on YouTube later and you can watch it slower <laughs> if you need to. Okay, so here's an example out of the book. All right, this is a simple clamp assembly you might design for some jig or something in your, in your workshop, if you have a wood shop or something like that. And we're gonna show what the complete um, working drawing package is gonna look like, okay? Um, oops, I'm going too fast. So the first thing you do is you, you sketch out what the assembly drawing is gonna look like and you see the sketch here. The engineer and drafting person decided that they only need two views to have everything in the drawing, but Right now, nothing's labeled, okay? So the first thing you do after you do this um, essential drawing is to fill in the parts list, right? That'll give you the find numbers, and then you do the, then you fill in the title block, okay? So now we've got the parts list in the upper left, and notice since it's in the top of the drawing, of the assembly drawing, the, the find numbers goes from smaller to higher as you go down the page. If we were to put it on the bottom, you'd flip it and go the other way. You'd go from the bottom up, okay? We also put in our, um, our ballooning. So we have nicely um, organized balloons with the fine numbers included and the leader lines pointing to the part. So we've got three and four here. So what's three? Three is the pin. 
It's pointing to the pin. And four is a snap ring. Okay, that's really hard for me to see in this drawing, right? So as an engineer, you could do a detailed drawing of just this part. Okay, so you could put a circle around this and call it A and then label A here. And then you'd see an expanded view of it and you could show the individual um, parts to it to make it more sensical where that snap ring is going, okay? And we filled out the title block down here. We got our drafter, it was checked, our engineer. We don't care about the material in this case. And we always give it a name. So this is called a clamp. So if somebody says, I need the assembly drawing for the clamp, then you can find it because that's what you label this assembly drawing, okay? And you may have several revisions. This is Rev Zero, but if you, if you rework the design, let's say they find out that uh, that type of snap ring doesn't work or that kind of um, pin isn't correct, we need a different type or those holes need to be placed slightly different, then you'd have to redo the assembly drawing and you'd update the revision to Rev 1 or Rev 2 or Rev 3, okay? The reason you do that is all of your, your individual part drawings are gonna go with that revision. So everything is kept together and organized, okay? Um, and then you can um, add other things. EGE might be the name of the company or the team that's working on this, okay? Um, size refers to the print size, so if you print it out, there's a specific plotter size that you're going to use and that sort of thing. Okay, and then, um, then you fill in the title block and, okay, here's another example. We showed a real simple one. This is a, a little more complex. Okay, and um, this would be the first part the detailed part drawing for the from the assembly. Okay, so we're gonna fill in the missing information in the title block and the seven dimensions. All right, so this is page two of five. Look at the lower right. So this is the first detailed drawing of a part from the assembly drawing. So remember, we started with this as our assembly drawing. And then we're gonna do the detail drawing for the base. Okay, so the title of this drawing is base and that should match what you write in your parts list. Find number one. So the find number typically goes in order of how you do the detail drawings. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do after the assembly drawing is the base detail drawing. And that's what it is and then this part is the one where all the dimensioning occurs, okay? So you've got the, you know, what kind of face it is, how deep, how many holes, where are the holes placed? Remember all this from dimensioning? How you're gonna do this curve here, right? You've got a radius, you've got uh, distances, okay? And then you say, well, what's the tolerancing? That's down in the title block in this case, unless otherwise specified, Dimensions are in inches, so this is 100 inches. It's a heck of a clamp, okay? Um, and, you know, if there's two places, it's plus or minus 0.05 inches. And if it's three places, it's plus or minus 0.001 inch. So that would be a thousandth of an inch, okay? So if it has three places, it's a thousandth of an inch. And if it's two places, it's, it's um, five, hundredths of an inch. Okay, and again, you've got the people who did the drawings, who signed off on it. And, th and in that case, if there's a question, they can go to that drafter or that engineer and say, why'd you sign off on it? It's, it's obviously wrong, you know. So there's a certain level of responsibility and, um, and um, following the chain of, of the evolution of the drawing. Okay. So um, I already posted these slides, so you can pull them up 
um, in detail and, and look at each one in your own time and look at the details and get a better feel for it. Okay, fill in the title block and add three missing dimensions. So now we're on the next part. Okay, so let's see what part that was. That should be the weight plate. And it is. So this is the weight plate. Okay, here are all the details. This is the third page of five. So that tells you this is page three out of a five page um, drawing package. And the first page is the assembly drawing and then the other four are gonna be the four parts. Okay, so this is the weight plate. And again, we have our dimensioning here. Um, the tolerances are put into the title block and the tolerance block. All right, so you don't have to clutter the drawing up with tolerances if they're all gonna be the same, okay? And then this is our pin. We pointed to the pin, if you remember. So that's what it looks like. So we've got to fill in all that. It's sheet four of five. There are dimensions. Okay, now we know what the pin looks like. This might be a special pin that's, um, that's fabricated at the work site where they're gonna assemble it. It's not an off the shelf pin, it's unique. So they have to machine that. Ideally, if, if you're designing something like this and you're gonna have a, have a pin, you try to find one on, on you know, McMaster car or someplace like that. You can generally find these sorts of things at pennies per, per part because they mass produce them. So companies will mass produce standard parts. They'll make 10,000 of these or 100,000 of these and then you just order 100, 1,000, whatever you need, right? And it makes it a lot cheaper. If you only need, you know, 500 of these things and you have to machine them, it's going to be a lot more expensive for you to set up the tool and machine only 500 parts. While a big factory in India or China, you know, will crank out 100,000 of these, put them in a shelf, and then set up for the next little part, make 100,000 of them, put them in a shelf. Okay. So now we have to do a standard parts sheet. So this one's real easy. We're not gonna do anything fancy on this. I'll show you um, some other ones uh, later on. But that's all there is to this one. Now you can do it differently. Some people like to put a picture of the part. So you can download the drawing of the part from McMaster car, put it in there, and then label the part with um, the part number and where, where you purchase it from. So you would get the McMaster car um, part number associated with that standard part, okay? And then by having a three-dimensional image of it, an isometric image of that um, snap ring, you can see exactly what the snap ring should look like because some are slightly different than others. And it's often easy to get them confused and having a picture adds to the clarity. Okay, so here's an example that a, a group did, I think last semester in design one, or maybe it was two semesters ago. Okay, the team name was well balanced. They designed this widget to balance, I think, bicycle tires. Um, several of the team members were bicycle enthusiasts. And um, I'm not a bicycle expert, but I was told that, you know, balancing the bicycle tires is really, really important. Um, got someone in the waiting room. So balancing bicycle tires is really important. And you can see um, what they came up with. Um, and they spent a lot of time on this. So they did an excellent job. They got a perfect score on their assembly drawings and their, their graphics. Um, they really, they really did a good job. And, you know, they color coded it to make it a little bit nicer, right? And, you know, you can do that in your future designs as well. It helps bring out the, the part and what, it, what it's gonna look like in the end. You have the, the drawing up in the upper right, that's the assembled view. So that's what it looks like when you put it all together. 
And then the, the assembly drawing here is an exploded view. And that's a common thing to do. And you can do that in SolidWorks. You can create an exploded view. And then you can even have an animation you can do in SolidWorks where that exploded view comes together. Okay, which will help the assembly people see how the parts all come together. All right, so as an engineer, you can do additional things um, um, to, to add clarity to it by animating and whatnot, okay? So we've got several parts here. We're not gonna look at each part individually. We're gonna look at a few parts that they did. So you can see there's some sub-assemblies here, right? So if you look at this, um, the item numbers or the parts going up, You've got a base plate, you got some leveling feet, and then here on number three is a true truing arm subassembly. Okay, and then number seven is a side sub assembly. So side sub assembly. So you're gonna see two sub assemblies that make up this assembly and some other parts. So let's go to the next page. So this is the side sub sub assembly. Okay, so that shows uh, um, that shows what it would look like. Now this doesn't have the balloons in it, okay? But this does. All right. So this is the way you would do um, the side subassembly. Okay. The reason they have two drawings is they wanted to add clarity. All right, so this is what it looks like when it's all put together, and this is the exploded view when it's apart. Okay, and I, I allow that. I think that's a good idea to do that. So this shows the subassembly labeled with balloons. Okay, once again, the fine numbers, and then here's another subassembly, and then here are the different individual parts. So that's where the, the base plate, for example, it's showing where all these holes would be drilled and what kind of holes they are. And UNC is a standard, so you'll learn about that when we do fasteners. Um, we're gonna do that chapter after this chapter. Or we may do 3D printing. I'm not sure exactly what order we're gonna do the last couple of things at, okay? But it's very important to be able to, to put the holes in exactly the right place. And then here's another part. So this is a side outer webbed, they call it. Okay, and you can see um, that's basically the posts that, or the post holders that the thing goes into. And it, and it allows for some adjusting, right? You can see where these pin, pins would go to adjust the height, depending on what type of bicycle tire you're gonna be balancing, okay? So that's all I had um, for this. So I'm going to 